Well, we're going to have a whole lot of bluster tonight and not a lot of reading. Oh. <laughs> well, last time we finished Act 1 of Measure for Measure. We will not finish Act 2 tonight. We won't even finish two scenes, sad to say. <laughs> okay. We'll pause the... Uh, This is an unusual night tonight. <laughs> Just go with it. Is it still going? Yes. That's all right. You can see all kinds of racy things on tape if you like. I'll just respond as though you were saying and doing racy things, and then it will be on the tape anyway, whether you're culpable or not. We didn't make it through uh, Act One last time, did we? Yep. Oh. We got to the end. I thought we have a scene left. No. We got through all of it. Jerry says, I'm not familiar with this play. Oh, I, I, it's been a long time. Yeah, I'm more familiar with the tragedies. Hmm. This is sort of a tragedy. A few, a few of the comedies. Yeah. Shoot. I'll talk to Midsummer Night's Dream at the other time. <laughs> you might not. <laughs> Eventually, when you need tapes on that, I'll do that too. I have many, many tapes. This summer, I'm going to start the project, I hope, okay. anyway. I'm going to start the project of taking all those lectures and getting on the net. And we just went through uh, Caesar and Macbeth. Oh, yeah. And when my colleagues talk about it, it's not. Well, maybe I should pause it because as soon as I get it paused, it will. Uh, all right, let's start out reading Act 2, Scene 1, which is on page 19. I'll start and then I'll pass it to Jerry. <coughs> oh, you left your glasses. <laughs> <in there>. oh. <laughs> I've been able to read without a sofa. We'll find out if I can, I can do it tonight. Nineteen. If Richard can hold the book for me, I should be able to read. <laughs> you can pass. All right. We start out with Angelo. We must not make a scarecrow of the law setting it up to fear birds of prey and let it keep one shape till custom make it their perch and not their terror. Aye, but yet let us be keen and rather cut a little, then fall and bruise to death. Alas, this gentleman whom I would save had a most noble father. Let but your honor know whom I believe to be most straight and virtuous that in the working of your own affections had time for her with place or place with wishing, or that the resolute acting of your blood could have obtained the effect of your own purpose, whether you had not some time in your life erred in this point which now you censured him and pulled the law upon you. It's one thing to be tempted to stress, another thing to fall. I not deny. <clears throat> Julie passing on the prisoner's life. Name the sworn thrall, have a thief or two. Guiltier than <clears throat> him they try. 
has openly made to justice. That justice ceases, that knows the law. <clears throat> what knows the law, the fields do not pass on fields. It's very threatening. The jewel that we find, we scoop and take it because we see it. But what we do not see, we tread upon and never think of it. We do not <coughs> extenuate this offense, for I have such cause that <coughs> God will tell me, when I that censure him, do so offend, that my own judgment pattern out my death, and nothing come impartial. So, he must die. <coughs> Be it as your wisdom will. Where is the purpose? Here, if it like your honor. See that Claudio be executed by nine tomorrow morning. Bring him his confessor, let him be prepared. For that's the utmost of his probity. Well, heaven forgive him and forgive us all. Some rise by sin, some by virtue fall. Some run from breaks of ice and answer none, and some condemned for a fault alone. Come, bring them away. If these be good people in a common world that do nothing but use their abuses in common houses, I know no law. Bring them away. How now, sir? What's your name? And what's the matter? <clears throat> Please, Your Honor, I am the poor Duke's constable, and my name is Elbow. I can be upon justice, sir. <laughs> bring him there before your good honor two notorious benefactors. Benefactors? Well, what benefactors are they? Are they not malefactors? If it please, Your Honor, I know not well <coughs> what they are, but precise villains they are that I am sure of, and void of all profanation in the world that good Christians ought to know. This comes off well. Here's a wise officer. Go to. What quality are they of? Elbow is your name? Why dost thou not speak, Elbow? He cannot, sir. He's not a devil. <laughs> what are you, sir? He, sir, a capture, sir, partial bond, <clears throat> one that served a bad woman whose house Turner was, as they say, tucked down in the suburbs, and now she professes a hot house, which I think is a very ill house, too. How know you that? My wife, sir, whom I detest before heaven and your honor. How? Your wife? I, sir, whom I thank heaven, is an honest woman. Dost thou detest her, therefore? I say, sir, I will detest myself also, as well as she, that this house, if it not be bod, a bod house, God's house, it is a city of life. It is for, it is a naughty house. <coughs> How dost thou know that, constable? Mary, sir, by my wife, who, if she had been a woman cardinally given, might have been accused in fornication, adultery, and all uncleanliness there. <coughs> by the woman's means? I answer by Mr. Soberdon's means, that as she spit in his face, so she defiled him. Sir, if it please your honor, this is not so. Prove it before these harlots here, thou honorable man, prove it. Do you, do you hear how he misplaces? <coughs> Sir, she came in great with child, and longing, saving your honor's reverence, for stewed prune. <laughs> Sir, we had but two in the house, which at that very distant time stood, as it were, in a fruit dish, a dish of some threepence. Your honors have seen such dishes. They are not china dishes, but very good dishes. Go to, go to, no matter for the dish, sir. No, indeed, sir, not of a pin. You are bearing in the right, but to the point, as I say. This mistress elbow, being as I say with child, and being great belly, and longing as I said for prune, and having but two in the dish, as I said, now <laughs> it draw here, this very man having eaten the rest, as I said, and as I say, paying for them very honestly, for as you know, Master Frost, I could not give you three pence again. Oh, indeed. Very well. You being then, if you remembered, cracking the stones of aforesaid prunes. Aye, so I did indeed. Why, very well. 
I tell you then, if you be remembered <coughs> that such a one and such a one were past, past pure of sin, you work out <coughs> unless they kept very good diet, as I told you. Oh, this is true. <coughs> Why, very well then. Tom, you are a serious fool to the purpose what was done to Elbow's wife that he have cause to complain of. Come ye to us for dungeon her. Sir, your honor, can I come to that yet? <laughs> no, sir, nor I mean it not. Uh, sir, but you shall come to it? Yeah. By your honor's leave, and I beseech you, look into Master Croft here. Sir, a man of fourscore pounds a year, whose father died in Howell's Moss, was not at Howell's Moss, Master Croft? Oh, how indeed. Why, very well, I hope here be truth. <clears throat> he, sir, sitting, as I say, in a lower chair, sir, it was in a bunch of grapes, where indeed you have a delight to sit. Have you not? I have so, because it is an open road and good for winter. Why, very <clears throat> well then. I hope here be truths. This will last out a night in Russia. <laughs> it takes our longest there. I'll take my leave and leave you to the hearing of the cause, hoping you'll find good cause to whip them all. <laughs> I think no less. Good morning, dear Lordship. Now, sir, come on. What was done to Elbow's wife once more? Once, sir? There was nothing done to her once. <laughs> <laughs> I beseech you, sir, ask him what this man did to my wife. I beseech your honor, ask me. <laughs> <laughs> well, sir, what did this gentleman, what did this gentleman to her? <clears throat> I beseech you, sir, look at this gentleman's face. Good Master Foss, look upon his honor. It's for a good purpose. Does your honor mark his face? Aye, sir, very well. Nay, I beseech you, mark it well. Well, I do so. Doth your honor see any harm in his face? Why no? I suppose upon the book his face is the worst thing about him. <laughs> Good. Then if his face be the worst thing about him, how could Master Frost do the constable's wife any harm? I would know that, Your Honor. I would know that of Your Honor. He's in the right. Constable, what say ye then? What say ye to it? <clears throat> First, and it like you, the house is a respected house. Next, this is a respected fellow, and his mistress is a respected woman. By this hand, sir, his wife is more respected person than any of us all. <laughs> any of us all. <laughs> Marvus, thou liest, thou liest, wicked Marvus. The time is yet to come that she was ever respected with man, woman, or child. Sir, she was respected with him before he married you. Which is the wiser here, justice or iniquity? Is this true? O oh, thou caitiff, O oh, thou, thou varlet, O oh, thou wicked Hannibal, I respected with her before I was married to her. If ever I was respected with her, or she with me, not, not your worship think me a poor duke's officer. Uh, prove this, thou wicked Hannibal, or I'll have mine action a battery on thee. If he took you a box over the, over the ears, you might have your action of slander too. <laughs> Natty, I thank your good worship for it. What is your worship's pleasure I shall do with this wicked ticket? Do the officer, <clears throat> because he hath some offenses in him that thou wouldst discover if thou couldst, let him continue in his courses till thou knowest what they are. Mary, I thank your worship for it. Thou seest, thou wicked varlet, now will come upon thee. Thou art to continue now, thou varlet. Thou art to continue. Where were you born, friend? Here in Vienna, sir. Are you of four score pounds a year? Yes, and to please you, sir. So, what trader are you of, sir? The captor, a poor widow captor. Widow's captor. Your mistress's name? Mistress Overdone. Perhaps <laughs> 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 she had any more than one hundred. Nine, sir. Nine, sir. Overdone by the last. 
Nine. Come hither to me, Master Froth. Master Froth, I would not have you acquainted with tapsters. They will draw you, Master Froth, and you will hang them. Get you gone and let me hear no more of you. I think, Your Worship, for my own part, I never come into any room in the tap house, but I am drawn in. <laughs> well, no more of it, Master Froth. Farewell. Come hither to me, Mr. <clears throat> Master Tapster. Okay. What's, what's your name, Master Tapster? Okay. <clears throat> Bill. Bum, sir. <laughs> <laughs> Pompey, by being a bawd? What do you think of the trade, Pompey? Is it a lawful trade? If the law would allow it, sir. <laughs> but the law will not allow it, Pompey, nor it shall, nor it shall be allowed in the end. It shall not be allowed in the end. Does your worship mean to jail a slave or the youth of the city? <laughs> no, Pompey. Truly, sir, in my poor opinion, they will sue it then. If your worship will take order for the drabs and the knaves, you need not fear the bonds. There's pretty orders beginning, I can tell you. It is but heading and hanging. If you head and hang all that offend that way, but for ten years together, you'll be glad to give out a commission for more heads. If this law holds the end of ten years, I'll rent the fairest house in it after three pence a bay. If you live to see this come to pass, say Pompey told you so. Thank you, good Pompey. And in requital of your prophecy, hark you. I advise you, let me not find you before me again upon any complaint whatsoever. No, not for the <laughs> dwelling where you do. If I do, Pompey, I shall beat you to your tent and prove a shrewd Caesar to you. In plain dealing, Pompey, I shall have you whipped. So, for this time, Pompey, fare you well. I thank your worship for your good counsel, but I shall follow it as the flesh and fortune shall better determine. Whip me? No. No, let Carmen whip his day. The valiant heart's not whipped out of this trade. Come hither to me, Master Noble. Come hither. Master Constable, how long have you been in this place of constable? Uh, seven years and a half, sir. <coughs> I thought by the readiness of your office, you had continued it, continued in it some time. You say seven years together? And a half, sir. Alas, it has been great pains to you. They do you wrong to put you so off the time. Are there not men in your ward sufficient to serve us? Faith, sir. If you have any whipped in such matters as they have chosen, they are glad to choose me for them. I do it for some piece of money and go through with all. Look you, bring me in the names of some six or seven the most sufficient of your parish. To your worship's house, sir? To my house. Very well. One o'clock. Thank you. Eleven, sir. <clears throat> I pray you home for dinner with me. I humbly thank you. <clears throat> it grieves me for the death of Lord Angelo is severe. It is but needful. Mercy is not itself. That oft looks so. Pardon is still the nurse of second woe. But yet, poor Claudio, there is no remedy. Come, sir. <laughs> um, A lot of running commentary, not much on this scene, but in the next. At line five, there is an allusion to pruning rather than felling a tree. That is extremely classical. The Orphic mystics referred to the purging of the soul and the cleansing of it 
as the pruning of a fig tree. And the purpose for it was to keep the tree fruitful and less liable to disease. The idea is, is that the more foliage there is on the tree, the less likely it is to go to fruit. And if you keep the foliage down to some extent, it'll go to fruit. The way the Orphics looked at it was not so much in terms of fruiting, but when they locked things away or chipped things away, they looked at it more or less the way a sculptor looks at a block of stone or at a block of wood, and that by chipping away uh, everything that was impure or everything that was adventitious to the character, that they would eventually pr uh, produce a character that was as beautiful as a statue was beautiful. So there was, was a slightly different process. It certainly wasn't the uh, historical view like we do with retrospection by looking at our sins daily by going backwards. They would had a much different way of doing it. The whole process in the Orphic Mystery Schools was called intellecte. But in any case, uh, in either exercise, whether it's retrospection or whether it is the pruning of the fig, if it is too severe, it saps one instead of actually invigorating. Uh, the, tr the tree is going to die no matter how strong the roots are if, if the tree is too weak to sustain life. In fact, for a while I lived out in the desert in Southern California friend let me use her house for a season or so and there was a lovely fig tree that I lived there that I that I that I really liked there and the man next door pruned it and he over pruned it and he killed the fig tree and it uh, bothers me to this day every time I go through that little town the killing of the fig tree in the Gospels is probably an allusion to the same process in uh, the Greeks. The uh, activities of all the mysteries are found in the Gospels of the Bible. Like for example, from the Eleusinian mysteries, which are slightly different, the first action on the first day was driving pigs down to the sea, which is one of the things that is common to all of the uh, first three Gospels. The same story is there. But in the case of Christ, he withered the tree because it wouldn't bear fruit out of season, which is kind of unusual. But if you think about it in the sense of uh, what Christianity really means, that is a union with the Christ in the life spirit, one should be seasonless. That is, one should be fruitful at any time, in any place, and not merely, not merely in some kind of natural season. It should be something that's with us constantly. And in another way, the withering of the fig tree is very likely to say that uh, whatever isn't fruitful, I'm going to root out altogether. And it's like saying that the grace or the love that comes from Christ in the new religion is so fundamental that it forgives everything. And the fig tree, in that sense, isn't necessary anymore. Moving a little further into the scene, Escalus suggests mercy and compassion and fellow feeling and when he does so, he does it in the spirit of judge not, lest ye be judged. And at line 24, Angelo has a very <coughs> interesting response where he uh, talks about the jewel, where if you don't see a jewel in the street, you just trot on it and keep right on walking. But if you see it, you pick it up and you have something very valuable. This is going to stretch you a little bit, but if you will remember the argument from the first act of the Winter's Tale, Leontes 
when talking about his discovery of his wife's unfaithfulness, which really wasn't a discovery but a, a hallucination on his part, he alludes to a superstition, and that superstition is that if there's a spider in your cup and you don't see it and drink it, the poison won't affect you. But if you do see the uh, spider, then the taking down of the draft will be uh, will be lethal. It will kill you. Now, that's obviously a superstition because uh, the poison is the poison no matter what. But somewhere in there, there is a grain of truth. What is valid in that statement is that when we see something negative and when we see something dangerous, we believe it. And very often, we become very dark and negative and fearful in our thinking, and we make ourselves overly vulnerable. This is one good reason why not to look at negative things unless you're very positive in yourself. So when Angelo is told that the jury probably has some on it that are guilty of more serious crime, then uh, Claudio Avers that uh, we are conscious and that consciousness changes everything. It's like saying if we have sins, if somebody has a sin and doesn't see it, it's all right. Out of sight, out of mind is the idea. And that's the way it's being taken in this instance. It is interesting that Angelo frames this principle of conscious recognition in a very positive uh, image. Not with a spider in your drink, but with finding a jewel. And he doesn't refer to it as discovering somebody's dark sins or secrets. He's referring to it as a jewel. Now, I don't like Angelo's self-righteous justice, his judgment of other people, but uh, I do agree that uh, discovery of a sin should be a joy. And that the correction of it should also be a joy. It shouldn't be something that we're dark about. Because after all, we're all seeking improvement. I also agree with Angelo in that uh, it is right that once we know about a fault or a sin, it does change everything. And we are responsible because this is something that happens to us all the time. In some ways, we're blessed in our fallen state by temporary ignorance. <clears throat> we have a large backlog of sin behind us we have a lot of things that are festering beneath our consciousness. And if we were to be aware of them all, we might be overwhelmed at the enormity of our own being and at the enormity of what we have to redeem. We just can't uh, bear that. So this way, when we do have an unconsciousness or a forgetfulness or things are buried almost like underneath layers of sedimentation, uh, things come to us gradually. We get one thing after another, after another, after another, and pretty soon we're strong enough by having redeemed things to be able to see more. And it seems that this is a much better way of self-improvement than trying to do everything all at once. However, I'm not convinced about the wisdom of exposing others to the conscious consciousness of their sin. If uh, we are calling somebody's attention to their sins, they are, um, it can be a very devastating thing. 
unless you're a psychiatrist or unless you are a very practiced confessor or unless you are working under a lot of spiritual intuition to out somebody or to cause a crisis in their consciousness by bringing them out before they're capable of bearing it, I don't think that is a wise thing, a wise thing at all. And I think it is even a less wise thing and it requires even much more skill to correct others. In fact, I think that uh, human correction is a very, very dicey matter. And, but that's exactly what we have to do uh, to some extent we are becoming part of the forces of destiny and not just subjects of destiny. And therefore, we have to go through our apprenticeship of learning how to correct others and improve them and be like the law itself. Now, we'll have much more to say about corrections later on. All the rest of the scene, it, with the clowns accusing each other and smarting off, seems pretty empty, but there are a few things that are said in it. First of all, it shows people that we have all met. We've all met those people who try to impress other people with their knowledge or with their intelligence, and then they use all sorts of malapropisms. They seem to be unable to get to a point, they just dance around it like these people dance around. If you notice through the whole scene, they never did come to an issue or they never did come to a point. But at the same time, they're great at wise cracks and uh, lewd puns and all sorts of things like that. Uh, there hasn't been a job that I've worked at that there hasn't been that kind of a person. That they're maybe not the brightest in the world, but they got all of those weird, funny things to say. Through them and uh, with Escalus, Shakespeare seems to be making a point <coughs> that immorality and illegal behavior is pandemic. It isn't just in the nobles like Claudio, but it is also in the uh, in you know the very uh, extents of society, everybody is guilty of it. Almost all of society, as uh, one gentleman says in here, would have to be arrested or punishment punished or executed by Angelo's strict standards. That's what happens when the law and correction is applied from without. It becomes an enormous and inefficient activity. Just think about it. If we get into it too much ourselves, our country might be policing the whole world pretty soon. It's ever so much better when the urge to correction and the means to correction come from within. Because then they come at their own pace. And they find the own, their own way of accomplishing things. With cause and consequence, team together with rebirth, that's what's going to happen anyway, whether the law is, the human law is there or not. The final thing I want to mention about all of this is the tedium. Even Angelo has to flee because he can't handle it, because it goes on and on and on. These characters are exaggerated, and their interactions are exaggerated a little bit, even though they are true characters that we have seen like this, but maybe not that exaggerated. But we've seen a lot of people that can't get to the point. They never can. If you think about it, it happens to all of us. Sometimes we just don't want to be frank and face the truth straight on and we all dance around. We won't be pinned down and we'll deflect to all kinds of nebulous things. 
This is kind of frustrating to read this. So the uh, this is what happens in our consciousness if we allow ourselves to be distracted. And using distraction in the ancient sense of the word, we get distracted into uh, immorality and all of the other things that tempt us. And soon we don't have a good focus of consciousness and because we don't want to face what we've done, we perpetuate a deflected and diffuse or nebulous consciousness. This is why the very first spiritual exercises are always concentrative exercises because with the concentrative exercise, you have to focus on an issue and meet it straight on and no other kind of higher consciousness can really be unfolded without that kind of concentrative ability and especially the moral progress that is necessary for the spirit to allow its powers to be unfolded in us cannot be brought out unless we have direct face ourselves self-honesty. And uh, until then we're going to live ambiguous lives like these all of these clowns are living ambiguous lives. All right, let's read the next scene. Let's see, I think, uh, Eric, you're up. Finish hearing of a cause, you will come straight. I'll tell him of you. Pray you do. For no one's pleasure, maybe he will relent. Alas, he hath but offended. He hath but as offended in a dream. All sex, all ages smack of this vice, and he to die for it. Now, what's the matter, Provost? Is it your will, Claudio, shall die tomorrow? Did, I, did not I tell thee? Hadst thou not ordered? Why dost thou ask again? If I might be too rash, under your good direction, I have seen, when after execution, judgment hath repented or his reason. Go to, let that be mine. Do you your office, or give up your place, and you shall be well spared. I crave your honor's pardon. What shall be done, sir, with the groaning Juliet? She's very near her hour. The fourth of her is the more fitting place, and that is he. Here is the sister of the man condemned. Desires access to you? Has he a sister? I, my good lord, are a very virtuous maid. Shortly have a sisterhood, if not already. Well, let her be admitted. See you the fornicatress be removed. Let her have needful but not lavish means. There shall be order, order for it. Save your honor. Stay a little while. You're welcome, what you will. I am a woeful suitor to your honor. Please but your honor hear me. Now well, what's your suit? There is a vice that most I do abhor, and most desire should meet the blow of justice, for which I would not plead, but that I must, for which I must not plead, but that I am at war twixt, will and will not. Well, the matter? I have a brother is condemned to die. I do beseech you, let it be his fault, and not my brother. Heaven give thee moving graces. <clears throat> condemn the fault and not the actor of it. Why every fault condemned ere it be done. Mine were the very cipher of a function. To find the fault is crime stands in record. And let go by the actor. Oh, just but severe law. I had a brother then. Heaven keep your honor. Give it not or give it not or so or her soul. To him again, entreat him. Kneel down before him. Hang upon his gown. You are too cold. If you should need a pin, you could not say with more tame a tongue, desire it. To him I say, but desire it to him I say. Must he needs die? Maybe no remedy. Yes, I do think that you might pardon him. And neither heaven nor man be that is missing. I will not do it. 
But you can, if you would. But can you, if you would? Look what I will not that I cannot do. But might you do it and do the world no wrong, if so your heart were touched with that remorse, as mine is to him? He's sentenced. It is too late. You're too cold. Too late? Why no? I that do speak a word may call it again. Well, believe this. No ceremony that too great one long, not the king's crown, nor the death deputed sword, the marshal's truncheon, nor the judge's robe, become them with one half so with a grace as mercy does. If he had been as you, and you as he, you would have slipped like him, but he like you would not have been so stern. Where are you? Be gone. I would to heaven I had your potency, and you were Isabel. Would it then be thus? No. I would tell what were to be a judge and what a prisoner. Aye, touch him. There's the vein. Your brother is a forfeit of the law, and you but waste your word. Alas, alas, why all the souls that were were forfeit once. And he that might the vantage best have took found out the remedy. How would you be if he, which is the top of judgment, should but judge you as you are? Oh, think on that, and mercy then will breathe within your lips like man new made. Be you content, fair maid. It is the law, not I, condemn your brother. Were he my kinsman, brother, or my son, it should thus be with him. He must die tomorrow. Tomorrow, will that son, spare him, spare him. He's not prepared for death. Even for our kitchen, we kill the fowl of season. Shall we serve heaven with less respect than we do minister? To our gross self? Good, good, my lord, we thank you. Who is it that hath died for this offense? There may have committed it. I well said. Sorry, girl. The law hath not been dead, though it hath slept. <clears throat> Those many had not dared to do that evil. It's the first that did the edict infringe had answered for his deeds. Now it's awake. Take notes of what is done, and like a prophet, looks in the glass that shows what future evils, either new or by earnestness, new conceived, and so in progress to be hatched and born. Now are now to have the successive degrees, but they live, but here they live to the end. <coughs> show some pity. I show it most of all when I show justice, for then I pity those I do not know, which a dismissed offense would after gall, and do him right that answering one foul wrong lives not to act another. Be satisfied. Your brother dies tomorrow. Be content. Will you not be the first that gives this sentence, and he that suffers? Oh, it is excellent to have a giant's strength, for it is tyrannous to use it like a giant. That's well said. Could great men thunder as Jove himself does, Jove would ne'er be quiet. For every pelting, petty officer would use his thunder, use his heaven for thunder, nothing but thunder. Merciful heaven, thou rather with thy sharp and sulfurous bolt splits the unwedgeable and gnarled oak than the soft myrtle. But man, proud man, dressed in a little brief authority, most ignorant of what he is most assured, his glassy essence like an angry ape, plays such fantastic tricks before high heaven and makes the angels weep who with our spleens would all themselves laugh mortal. Oh, to him, to him, wench. He will relent. He's coming, I perceive it. Pray heaven she win him. Oh. No. <coughs> we cannot be our brother with ourselves. Great men may jest with saints. It's written them. But in the less, all of profanation. Not to the right girl, or that. That in the captain is but a choleric word, which in the soldier is flat blasphemy. 
Are your thighs so fast? Why do you put these sayings upon me? Because authority, though it errs like others, hath yet a kind of medicine in itself that skins the vice over the top. Go to your bosom, knock there, and ask your heart what it doth know that's like my brother's fault. If it confess a natural guiltiness such as is his, let it not sound a thought upon your tongue against my brother's life. He speaks in his such sense, and my sense reads with it. Very well. Gentle, my lord, turn back. I will be thinking. Come again tomorrow. Hark how I'll bribe you, my lord. Turn back. How? Bribe me? Any with such gifts that heaven shall share with you. You have marred all else. Not with fond sickles of the tested gold, or stones whose rate are either rich or poor, as fancy values them, but with true prayers that shall be up at heaven and enter there ere sunrise. Prayers from preserved souls, from fasting maids whose minds are dedicate to nothing temporal. Well, come to me tomorrow. Go, as well, away. Heaven keep you on your face. Amen. For I am that way going to temptation where prayer is gone. At what hour tomorrow shall I attend your lordship? Oh, dear. Have saved your honor. From thee, even from thy virtue, what's this? What's this? Is her fault or mine? The tempter or the tempted? Who sins most? Ha, not she, nor does she tempt. But it is I that lying by the violet in the sun do as the carrion does, not as the flower, corrupt with virtuous season. Can it be that modesty may more betray our sense than woman's lightness? Having waste ground enough, shall we desire to raz the sanctuary and pitch our evils there? O oh, fie, 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 what dost thou, or what art thou, Angelo? Dost thou desire her foully for those things that make her good, or let her brother live? Thieves for their robbery have authority when judges steal themselves. What? Do I love her that I desire to hear her speak again and feast upon her eyes? What is it I dream on? O cunning enemy, that to catch a saint with saints doth bait the hook. Most dangerous is that temptation that, that doth goad us on to sin in loving virtue. Never could the strumpet with all her double vigor, art and nature once stir my temper, but this virtuous maid subdues me quite. Ever till now, when men were fond, I smiled and wondered how. Well, there's quite a bit in here. We're not even going to finish this scene tonight. I'm going to get very, very wordy on you. Because there's so many things that are right on our topic. Let's go to the beginning and look at the very first uh, speech. The very first speech by the provost has a little tiny tidbit in it. Let's see here. I should have kept the bookmark. When he's talking about... Uh, He's saying that he's astounded that someone should die for having sex because everyone has done it for ages. Now, I don't know if Shakespeare meant, meant it by bringing our attention to this, but this is precisely Christian doctrine. St. Paul says the wages of sin is death. And he's talking about sin in this sense, pointing exactly to sexuality. We wouldn't be if there weren't sex. We wouldn't be immortal if we were without sex. We would die anyway. 
and we couldn't even come to birth without it. However, if we look at the cosmic facts, it is self-conscious, selfish, sexual expression and indulgence in it that closed us off from the inner spiritual worlds. And that brought us deeper into matter and uh, keeps us weak and keeps us darkened. One of the consequences of this is painful birth because we're more aware of our bodies. Previous to the fall, our consciousness was inward and we hardly knew anything of the external world. When our waking consciousness in the entire life cycle is focused in the external world, everything that we have we're afraid of losing. So we're afraid of death. And so both pain at birth and fear of death are part and parcel of our lives. And in fact, the fear of death probably even shortens our lives and makes it, uh, you know, the fear just racks our bodies. So we're all, just like the provost says, we are, in fact, dying because of sexuality. And we just don't get it. We don't get the whole idea of it. And the reason we don't is because we're in the dark. And we're in the dark so deeply that we don't know how far we are from really being awake. Now, in his defense, the provost is merciful toward Claudio, but the effort, because Angelo is so self-righteous and probably so because he's weak, uh, the effect of his standing up for Claudio, the, the provost standing up for Claudio, has the opposite effect, because Angelo is weak and is determined to live by a harsh law, digs in the more deeply. If we look further on on the next page, at line 29, we start to get at another topic. Isabella is beginning to talk about sex. She emphasizes the, that this issue is an issue which she struggles about. On one hand, she's chaste and she's reverend about the creative force which she believes should not be abused ever. On the other hand, she is pro-life and she does not want to see her brother taken away by capital punishment. What is exceptionally ironic about this speech is that despite her inward division and her inward ambivalence, everything is highly consistent. She's pro-life about uh, preserving the life force as far as sexuality is concerned, and she's pro-life about not going forward with capital punishment. If you think about it, even Pope John Paul has the same kind of high consistency. He's against abortion, he's against birth control, he's against capital punishment, he's against an unjust war, and uh, it's just clear all the way through. He's very consistent. Sometimes he does things for archaic reasons, but I think that he really is and does see the consistency of everything. Now, her next speech at line 34 is... Um, also interesting, it brings out something that's especially interesting to me, uh, though uh, you may have to resort to the footnote to get at what she's saying. What she is saying is a popular theological idea. I went going through this play, I was very surprised to see that this notion was this old. I thought this was just a modern theological idea. 
But if you think about it, the idea of just and moral wars goes at least far as far back as St. Augustine. So I guess this whole idea, uh, which goes something like, love the sinner, hate the sin. And I have to tell you, I have a lot of difficulty with that uh, philosophy. I don't have any problem with love the sinner. No problem with that at all. And we certainly must be at least repelled or disgusted by sin. So both clauses are thoroughly acceptable. And even the whole is in some ways acceptable except for what is meant by it. What is meant by it is that this is meant to be sort of a poor man's statement of grace or a poor man's version of forgiveness of sins. That's what Isabella means. However, it isn't really grace and it isn't really a forgiveness of sin. In true grace and forgiveness, there's a recognition of guilt and a very unctuous remorse because that's what prepares one for receiving true grace. There has to be an opening kind of feeling. And as long as we're hunkered down in our sin, it won't happen. There is also an influx of divine love wisdom that is capable of making things new, of making people new, and giving us a break. As this philosophy, love the sinner, hate the saint, is usually expressed, neither component, neither the unctuousness nor the love wisdom is there. This is what? Did you say love the sinner, hate the saint? The, oh, did I say saint? Love the sinner, hate the sin. All right, sorry. Okay, all right. So this is a pseudo grace. It's a pseudo grace, and it always seems to come come across to me as some namby pamby kind of thing. It's like an intellectual liberalism. It sounds good, and it's sort of a weak attempt at acting Christian. There's almost the belief that death is evil or bad, and that suffering is terrible, which isn't necessarily true. Now, I'm certainly not arguing in favor of Angelo and his death, uh, you know, his capital punishment, but I'm not going to say that death is bad. Ironically, uh, in light of everything that has been said earlier, everybody does it, just like everybody does sex. Everybody dies. I'm not at all in favor of capital punishment. Not at all. But it is better to die knowing the reason for one's death than to live in pleasant ignorance with no real goodness about them. There is another statement from the Bible in Christianity that I think is much more applicable. And it says, by their fruits ye shall know them. We are responsible for what we have done and we have to be aware of ourselves and our responsibilities and if we aren't, we're not going to grow. Nature and the principle of cause and consequence are not at all wishy-washy. None is saved under the law as the Bible says. There may be something to this philosophy, but to the speaker it always seems like somebody who is guilty is leaving somebody else off easy and that is really treating others with some kind of indulgence or some kind of favoritism, which the same kind of thing that we treat ourselves with when we're not being fair. 
But strangely enough, this is precisely the thing that the Duke was trying to accomplish when he faked leaving town and put, put the kingdom or the dukedom in the hands of uh, Angelo. So we can see no wonder that uh, Isabella is divided. The response that Angelo gives at line 38 shows a real keen understanding of cause and consequence. We are in our deeds and our intents are in our deeds. So when we say, by their fruits ye shall know them, we are saying just that. We are in our fruits and we, we are in them even before the blossoms. <clears throat> However, Angelo does not seem to recognize that in the ongoing chain of causes and consequences, we uh, can correct somewhere down the line. He's, be, he's putting it all just in this one instance. And when you put something in a one instance situation, uh, then death seems like it ends it all. But that isn't the reality, because the reality is in spirit, things go on, things continue. As we uh, proceed through the dialogue, we can note right away that Isabella sees his pride in his honor being tied up in the law. Angelo identifies with the law and his being as a dispenser of the law. And any time we identify with anything, we give something of ourselves to it, to the thing with which we identify. And when that happens, usually some kind of dependency develops. And in that process of identification, in almost all cases, we are weakened if we identify with a political party or with a uh, team of basketball or with a hero figure or something like that, we usually weaken ourselves in that. We've given part of our being away. In showing the way of love, Isabella demonstrates that he would be freed by the same act of mercy that freed her brother. If you look at lines 49 and 50, that's exactly what she's saying. Angelo has uh, lost so much pliability of his spiritual nature by identifying with the law and being its disposer that he's utter, utterly locked in like a mechanical or a mechanistic conception of law. If you look along line 52, it looks like a very mechanical view of law. And this is what happens when we separate our personality from the spirit. We become mechanical. If you've ever gone to a mental institution, or if you know people who are uh, quite schizophrenic, a lot of their movements are mechanical. It's because the personality has been removed from the spirit and is no longer supple. At line 55, Angelo demonstrates that he's so far locked into the law and into the concept of time that is coeval with the law that he thinks that the sin put in, is put into the cause and that it, you know, that the whole cause and consequence, that the sin is there throughout the whole thing, and that it's too late. That once the once the evil uh, intent or the evil motivation has been put into the cause, it's too late. You can't stop it then. Probably because he's not in control of himself. He's sold himself to that concept of law and of time that law is so dependent on. Isabella 
is in possession of herself. And she knows that in acts of grace and by her own inward efforts, she can step out of time and she can step into her spiritual being and she can recall some of her deeds in time. She can be forgiven and she can stop things from becoming worse. In the lovely speech at line 55 uh, through uh, 66, she shows the great power of creativity in grace. At the end of the speech, she even tries to draw in, do unto others as you would have others do unto you. She puts it in a different form than we normally see it, but she does all of this by trying to get him outside of his personality that is locked into the law. And if she says, well, if you be my brother and let my brother be you, in that kind of role playing, you can uh, move out of your identified personality and you can uh, perhaps be um, cured by, from this. When she does so, Angelo freaks out. And the first thing he wants to do, just look right after that speech, he wants to be rid of her. And he says, all right, bye, sweetie, you're out of here. Uh, just as much in the same way when you're materialistic and when you're blind and you see only things from this world, you think you can get rid of problems by executing. She's bothering me, she's getting to me, so I'll just get rid of her. I'll have her move out. Uh, these sinners that I don't like, I'll just execute them all and uh, uh, it's, you know, that, that'll be that. In the speech at line 73 to 78, she continues on with her arguments, only in this case she takes a much different stance. She takes the stance of grace in the, in the name of mercy, but it's still the same principle, and she takes it right to Christ. And at line 79, Angelo comes back with a classic argument. And in this argument, he shows his identification with the law and how he has dehumanized himself and he has taken the living character of his self-being and he sold it out to the law. He refuses to take responsibility, individual responsibility, and he blames it on the law. He can't act spontaneously and he can't act creative, creatively and bring about some kind of change. If you will remember, there have been two other times in this series of talks, the words that he uses are almost identical to the words of Euripides that we've quoted several times. It was not I, but my tongue that lied. And it isn't I that is going to execute your brother, but it is the law that's going to execute your brother. He's given up personality. At lines 82 to 88, that begin with, tomorrow, that's sudden. Spare him. Spare him. That, those, that speech is one of the best and one of the most long-standing arguments against capital punishment. The way she states it is not the best way it's ever been stated. But in effect, capital punishment is an outright admission that society and society's institutions are bankrupt of redemptive capability. If you cannot redeem someone by your society and by the institutions, then you're saying that your society is fails in the thing that is most important to it. Saying we can't redeem our citizens, we can't correct them, all we can do is get rid of them. There's a kind of disposability that comes with blind materialism where we don't see ongoing life. In our times, what is called the moral right 
likes to harp about minor moral failings and sins, but it doesn't recognize in its stance in favor of capital punishment that it is guilty of moral surrender. Isabella understands that in time, in prison or out of prison, or in any other way, in times, there are other means of correction. The character ripens. If it is constantly given love and mercy, it can be worked on. There can be correction. She can see this argument because she again can step out of time into the transcendent realm and within which everything has been created that is in time. Again, the response of Angelo at line 90 is the classic law and order statement. He reverts to a notion that if the first lawbreaker had been punished under this law as he would have had it, the law would be alive and well and doing what it was supposed to do. And it's a state which he would like to bring back. It is a state of pure law and order. He's living in a mental world, a world of empty abstractions that do not relate to reality. He cannot see reality, and he cannot make intuitive judgments. Now, after saying all of that, which we're going to examine a little bit, after saying all of that, it must be said that in a small way, he is right. If intuitive insight transcends the law, if it were working hand in hand, with the law, then each and every one of us would learn from the first instance. If intuitive insight were present with us all the time and we made a mistake or committed a sin, we would learn right away. And we wouldn't have to go through uh, so many replications of the same thing. Now that is an ideal state of love and the law working together. And that may have been what was intended for us. But now it is nowhere near true. So that is wishful thinking. It is a very empty abstraction. In a vague way, we actually have a demonstration of its fallacy but it is a demonstration complicated by evolutionary factors in a lot of human history. It sounds almost silly, but in the Garden of Eden story of Genesis, there is just that example. Adam and Eve were disobedient. They didn't trust the word of God or the gods within God. And they ate of the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. That's another way of saying they put themselves into the sway of the law so that they would know the difference between right and wrong and cause and consequence. They did that by ignoring faith, by ignoring trust, and uh, basically the word in which they should have kept their face in trust. This is the test of Angelo's contention. This is the very first case with consequential reprisal. We look at it. Did the consequences... with knowledge or the imperfect uh, physical 
and you know the consequences of the, of this deed were a self consciousness of our nakedness, both physical and moral, a fear of death, a relatively barren environment, and homicidal children were the consequences of this losing trust in what was behind the law. So, did this, did the punishing of this first transgression cure them immediately? The answer is as big and fat of a no as you can give. (laughs) We're living in the negation of that. However, recognizing this and saying it does not say that the law is impotent. And it doesn't say that the law is ineffectual because the law certainly is. It is merely saying that under given circumstances, the law, as powerful as it is as a learning tool, is not enough by itself alone. Under given circumstances, the law, as powerful as it is, is not enough by itself alone. So, let's look at those given circumstances. Our journey through the dense material world as humans can be likened in a simple way to a parabolic trajectory of a rocket. It has a starting point and it has an ending point. And the starting point and ending point are determined at its, at its launch, exactly like Angelo says. In the case of an ICBM, the starting point and ending point are determined before the launch. In the case of evolutionary creation, the starting point and the ending point are the spiritual worlds and the trajectory go through matter. But now suppose you nudge the rocket at the launch. It will have a different trajectory but the same law or laws of physics will be there from the start to the end. So the law is still there even though it's going to have a different trajectory because we made a little mistake and nudged it at the beginning. Now Angelo's argument is that the beginning and end are wrong in this new trajectory. And he's saying that the mission should be scrubbed or it should be aborted and that the missile should be blown up in mid-arc because the universal spirit is one and all-inclusive beginnings and ends are still going to be in the spiritual worlds. But the experience between the beginning and the end in the spiritual worlds is going to be different. But there's also the possibility, given the nudge that we have taken that has brought us deeper into materiality, that there may not be enough fuel to complete the new trajectory. And the rocket may burn itself up or dissolve. It's a possibility. But in any case, or in the case of a very rare failure, it is self-destruction. Not abortion, not a termination. That is the reason for things, for being unsuccessful. It isn't a blowing up like Angelo would have to do. It is a self-destruction. The fact of reality is that even with our deviant trajectory, every effort has been made by God and the gods within to redeem us and to carry us through our deviant experience. When we lost faith and disobeyed, 
and put ourselves exclusively under the law and put ourselves into an unintended trajectory into deep materialism, we did so by taking control of the creative energy before we had the wisdom to do it, to work with it. In effect, that means that we chose experience and experience under the law over faith and over insight. Now that's a little bit of an extreme statement because the way things were, our material eyes weren't opened immediately and our spiritual eyes weren't closed immediately. A better way to say it is that we disrupted a delicate balance between spirit and matter. But the disruption of that balance was not so drastic as one kid jumping off of the teeter-totter and the other one going boom down to the earth. It wasn't something like that. It was a matter of that we had turned enough of our attention downward and outward to disrupt the balance between insight and experience. So one of the effects of this imbalance of tilting toward material experience and being blinded in with our uh, spiritually blinded with our material eyes wide open is that we make the same dumb mistakes over again and again. We're selfish, we're ignorant, we can only see the forms and we have to do things over a long time before it sinks into our insight. So, without the insight, we can't learn with few replications in the way that Angelo would have us do it. He would have us learn right away from the first, uh, from the first mistake. And then it would be all over with. But the way, the course we took made that impossible because we closed off the means that would have allowed us to learn from the very first mistake. However, we must be uh, defensive of Angelo because we have to say that we all make the mistake that Angela mistake makes. Because we're because all of the characters in this play are in us. We do have insight after many replications, and we do have insight after the fact, and we kick ourselves in the butt and say, if only I had done such and such, this wouldn't have happened. And that's just the argument that Angelo is making. If we had enforced the law right away, this wouldn't have happened. Now that may be true. We don't know that it would be. But that may be true when we're speaking from a more timeless state of insight. And if we attribute, and if we look at afterthought, we are subject to a different kind of illusion we're subject to a, an illusion of empty abstraction. And that is what Angelo is subject to. Anytime we say, if only we had done this, that's an empty abstraction. And that keeps us from living right now. And then when we live right now, we live in insight and we are put into that timeless state that we can make corrections in the moment. We all know that... Uh, you know, it's an illusionary thing to attempt to take back the past and install it in the future. We see it in ball games. It happens all the time. Somebody makes a mistake and they start kicking themselves for it and saying, oh, I should have done this or I should have done that. And immediately they're following up in the moment and what is, what is unfolding right after. It doesn't work in life. So Angelo is completely wrong, at least in that abstraction, or we're completely wrong every time we do that. To restore the balance and to live 
more sinless lives require something more than a stern precedent. It requires something more than human enforcement. Because the divine law is there anyway, whether we humans do something about it or not. But again, that's not to say that human law is useless. We're going to come back to that theme much later on. It was, it is a part of divine law, our human law, and uh, it's a subject, our extension of that law and how we work into it. I think we'll have to, I'll have to just pass on that now. What is needed to restore the balance is not to, in a reactionary fashion or in a fundamentalist fashion, to try to go back. We can't Go back. What is needed is more of an influx of insight so that the balance between spirit and matter or between insight and experience is restored. The source is, very much as Isabella says, the source of insight is grace and mercy and forgiveness. She keeps pleading for that again and again and again. However, that grace or love cannot work effectively unless there is a seedbed in which it can be implanted and grow. That seedbed in our humanity is in the light and reflecting ethers of our soul bodies. We can grow those, we can develop that seed bed, and they can be, you know, the light and reflecting ethers can be incorporated into our soul bodies by experience, especially by volitional experience. Every time we use our senses to work for the good, every time we heat and drive our blood to serve selflessly, every time we think and see the truth in thought, And every time we remember with full recall, we're doing just that. We're building a soul body. So if you think about it, Isabella is exactly right on this account also. She argues that we don't take baby chicks and serve them for dinner. We wait until they have uh, become ripened, when they've become mature. And the same thing for humanity is if we have time to mature, that first instance when we nudged the rocket and took this trajectory into sin, it was impossible to correct at that point because we did not have the soul material. We made a mistake and this new trajectory has to be carried out following its arc and it cannot be redeemed and it cannot be corrected until the experience of that ark has produced enough soul material so that we can receive the insight and that we can receive the grace so that we can make the correction. It's a very important thing. Now, I'm not sure that Shakespeare uh, meant all of this in, this in this dialogue, but he certainly put some insightful arguments into his characters' mouths. I mean, they're, they're not the most beautiful uh, uh, speeches in all of Shakespeare, but they, uh, but they get right at essential arguments that have always been on these subjects of capital punishment and this whole idea, if only I had done this, he's, he's pretty good about all of that. Now, in the next few speeches, Isabella takes a quite different tack about things. She still pleads for mercy, always pleads for mercy, but she directs her words to humanity first and then to the representative of humanity before her. We're going to go over several passages a couple of times here. At 106, the speech at line 106, she disarms his self-absolution from responsibility as he sees himself as a blind cog in the wheel of the law, just doing his duty impersonally. She disarms that 
by making it personal and making himself to see himself as the prime agent of setting the precedent of judgment and her brother as the first victim. She won't let him get away and say that it's the law that's doing it. She makes him see it for himself. And when he's stripped of his robes of impersonality, she makes him see himself as a tyrant. In the speech at line 110, she demonstrates how facetious it is for ignorant and proud human beings to wield power. At line 126, the speech beginning there, she shows how our subjective ignorance, in our subjective ignorance, we have no right to judge others. And finally, in the speech beginning at 134, she shows intuitive insight by virtually stating that he is guilty of the same sins of her brother. <clears throat> now, there are remarkable lines, so let's briefly look at each of them uh, a little bit in detail. At 106, there's a contradiction. She holds Angelo directly responsible for his deeds and his judgment. She's guilty of a contradiction in that. Because this is the same woman that said, love the sinner, hate the sin. Now she's saying, you have to be responsible. She's sort of given up that uh, uh, lighthearted uh, pseudo-grace idea. Now you could say, that Angelo is responsible and that his deed is a loving deed, but I think that would be pretty much of a circumlocution. However, by her own grace, because she is what she is and lives by what she lives by, we have to forgive her her inconsistency. When we fell, we did more than just disrupt the balance between insight and experience. We introduced a foreign agency into our consciousness. We installed a shield of egoism and of vanity into our soul, into our inner being. With us, with this shield, we are separated from the universal spirit. We saw the nakedness of our isolation. We saw the loneliness of our existence. We recognized our vulnerability and how weak we are in our individuality. So we began to protect ourselves. We started to look out for number one. This combination of insecurity and selfishness led to a defensive stance. And eventually we came to see that offense is a pretty good defense. As time has continued, it has become a habit so that we try to dominate, to protect and make ourselves look good. This is why it's so difficult with this shield of egoism and fear and everything else that goes around it. It's difficult for us to judge correctly and with divine impersonality. And this is what she's pointing to exactly at line 110. Pure insight in the realm of love and grace and forgiveness is from the first of the realms of pure spirit. The realm of life spirit. That realm is beyond thought and it's beyond self, even higher self. Hence, it is both a realm of selfness and selflessness from which self is composed. Consequently, it is a realm of altruistic love and compassion. 
Everything else below it is limited by separation, especially when we get into the personal realms where subjectivity is behind the shield of egoism. That subjectivity is the order of the day. We can only see it our way. Some doctors try to take every medicine that they prescribe for their patients so that they can know what their patients are experiencing. We find it less and less these days that doctors have that kind of integrity, but there have been doctors that do that. Without insight, without grace, we really cannot judge others by our limited personal experience. And this is exactly what she's pointing out. Uh, she says it in words that are familiar to us, but we don't often think that we don't know what's going on inside of someone else. I don't know how we get it, but when we were kids, we had a lot of psychological weapons. They could have been passed on to us by older kids, but I don't remember that happening. They could have been brought to us by intuitions because when we are kids, we're very pure, we're very innocent. But in any case, as kids, we knew how to see through each other. And when we were angry, we had all kinds of taunts and all kinds of names for each other. And usually they were right on the mark. <coughs> and they weren't at all kind. I one one kid when I was growing up, we called her Fatty. <laughs> the teacher, <laughs> the teacher didn't want it done. She thought it was cruel and callous, but it hit the mark. And uh, she started asserting herself too much, and she got it. And kids worked that way, such that sometimes a bunch of kids in the schoolyard or on the playground would gang up on one individual <coughs> and they could really hiss that person with taunts. But there was always one retaliatory phrase that was the equalizer and it could neutralize just about every name or every taunt that you can think of. All a person had to say when they were being taunted was, it takes one to know one. And when that came through, uh, you couldn't doubt it. You couldn't doubt it anymore. And pretty soon, everybody was in the same boat. In some ways, that statement, it takes one to know one, is a psycho-spiritual fact. But it's a fact that needs some clarification. If we think about it, everything that is in the outer world is in us. That's because everything <coughs> in the outer world is a precipitation that is suspended within the universal spirit within the universal spirit which we all share. Thus, it is natural that we should see ourselves in the things outside of us. But if that's the case, why don't we know everything? The fact is that we only know the things that we are self-consciously aware of, the things that experience has brought to waking self-consciousness. Thus, the phrase, it takes one to know one, is very exactly true. But there's a bitter pill in this because the things that we are beginning to see in other people, especially the ones that bother us, are the very things that are in us 
that we are becoming aware of in ourselves that we don't want to admit to. It takes someone very pure and very well trained to bring a person to, take, to live out. It takes one to know one to help people to reconcile themselves with the things that they don't like in the external world because it's hard to come to that knowledge. It's hard to admit that to ourselves and sometimes when we do, we're overwhelmed by it. And this is precisely what psychiatrists do. They get people to realize what is working unconsciously in them into their waking consciousness and by the things that bother them in the world outside. Isabella is just that kind of individual. She is pure. And she knows herself and she's worked on herself. And she's gone through the same things that other people are only beginning to go through because they're a little bit slower about admitting to themselves. If you remember the clowns in the first scene, they were finding each other's faults right and left and they could uh, make all kinds of comments <coughs> about them. So when we look at the speech beginning on line 134, in effect, Isabella is saying to Angelo, it takes one to know one. And after all of these uh, lovely arguments that she's gone through, this is the argument that is the breakthrough argument. So even in sophisticated language, what is happening here is the great neutralizer from the uh, playground in a, very <laughs> in a very sophisticated way. So just looking at the speeches of Isabella in this scene, we see a psychological tour de force. We see a spiritual evolution in morality in its full sense. But there's one thing about the whole business that uh, puzzles me. I have a conclusion about it, but I'm not final in that conclusion. The thing that puzzles me is if she is so pure and if she is so moved by her morality, why does she have to be egged on and urged forward by Lucille and the provost? You would think that somebody that had that much insight would have the courage and conviction that would go with it. At Is first, courage and conviction in what sense? Oh, yeah. 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 I mean, in the sense that maybe what's more needed here is God. Uh, no, because Angelo admits in his last speech it is because of her purity that she gets through to him. And he chastises himself for lusting after her because she is so pure and that she has, he has that power. My first thought was maybe that it was just an innate shyness. Shyness occurs when we have something that we treasure inside of us and we're, we're, we don't want to expose it to the world uh, and in such a way demean it. And then for a while, I thought it was just another case of Elizabethan sexism that seemed to permeate Shakespeare plays. But finally, I have concluded that it was a rhetorical matter. If all of these speeches that we've looked at in separation were concatenated, uh, it would have been a very long speech. And if it were that long, it wouldn't have had as much power as each one being stated and then somebody egging her on and then she comes on with another one it has more power. And if they had been run together, it couldn't be pithy all the way. And she would have to have put some segues in between them because she puts forth a lot of different arguments. And if the segues in between were there, it would have been a grossly long speech and it would have been self-defeating. There's two words in there that... Um interested me when they were egging her on and told her to touch him. 
Yes. Yes. Yep. That, that's, that's great, great <coughs> insight. I had a friend that was a master salesman selling to housewives, and he said, there it comes a certain point in the sale that you touch the customer, and then he says, that changes everything. In the speeches at 144, 146, and 149, Isabella does something still different yet. I can't help but to love her for it because it's something I like to do myself. <laughs> she resorts to spiritual bribery. When she has punctured him with it takes one to no one, she openly resorts to spiritual bribery and says she's doing it. That's what these talks are. Sometimes they're entertaining. Sometimes they're interesting. But they're really spiritual bribery. They're hopefully to get people to aspire and uh, to try spiritual practices. But she really gives them a taste of honey. She gives them some of the nectar of heaven. And she does this when she's opened him up and he can receive it. He's been psychologically befuddled and in that befuddlement he doesn't have any more shields that he can put in front of him. So she has an <coughs> excellent balance in herself of breaking down defensive barriers and building up spirit. And even as she leaves, she does so with love and with courtesy. She says some things with sauce, but she does this all with, you know, it isn't, she doesn't defame him. And she doesn't, uh, you know, she makes him responsible, but she does not lose respect for him or cause him to lose respect for herself. She's a really classy lady. This is a quite a lovely character. Now there are several more topics that should be covered in Angelo's closing speech, but I just didn't have time to do them, and it's been awfully long for tonight anyway already. So we'll begin next time. If you want to take the books home with you and look at Angelo's speech and see what you would come up with it and the issues that are interesting to you, it will be uh, it will be a fun thing. That man is out there, and you just will never be and most of them have got to be here for sure. <laughs> yes. Yes, yes. Question. Yes. Do you think the time astrologically, <coughs> do you think the time astrologically was then about the same as it is now? Because if you look at society now and, when, and how this was written, there is much more likeness than we would like to uh, admit. Yes, even a lot of the slang that was prevalent then, come every year, every few years I run into some slang in Shakespeare that has come back since those times. Yes, England was at a big high at the time of Shakespeare, just like the United States is at a big high. And it was a lot of the same kind of decadence that went on. Is it a coincidence that it named Emmanuel? Um, no. Because almost all the characters seem to have yeah. names that seem to reflect something of their character. Yeah. yeah. I submit this over there. <laughs> <laughs> That's something we haven't done, but there are some excellent dictionaries of names on the web. And if you look up the meanings, of all of the names, we could have done it going all the way back to the Winter's Tale. They no, actually, no, 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 no. yeah, they actually say that Perdita means that which was lost and is found. But every name of every character in the Winter's Tale has something in the nameology of it that, uh, according to tradition, that goes along with who the character is. And Shakespeare does that quite a bit. He doesn't always do it, but, but that, is a, that is a thing that he does. Part of that may be a reflection of that old uh, Commedia dell'arte thing, you know, where the characters are personifications of yes. their names and that sort yeah. of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Archetypal or uh, uh, 
uh, what do you, what's the word I'm trying to think of? Caricatures. Goody, see, you didn't even fall asleep. I tried. <laughs> <laughs> Angelo reminds me a lot of Julius Caesar. Oh yeah? Well, yeah, yes, he does have some of the strange, you know, all the stars.